Hi, I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom here on WHOS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you very much for tuning into my show this morning. The topic that I'd like to talk about on the show today is the dark side of rebellion. Um, so rebellion is generally viewed by libertarians as a good thing. Uh, we don't particularly advise that the state should do much, uh, if anything. And so when people rebel against state power and they say, no more, we've had enough of your drug war, we've had enough of your taxation, we've had enough of your uh, incessant spying on us and murdering of people across the world, uh, we've had enough of this. And they stand up for that and they tell the state no more then we libertarians generally rejoice. Rebellion can be a very powerful and moving force for good in society. So if we kind of look back at the civil rights movement and we see Rosa Parks who sat down on the bus and demanded that she be treated as equally as other people in society, that was a very rebellious act for her to do so. Uh, she had to go against the status quo. People might have thrown her off the bus. They uh, might have gotten really upset and put her in jail or something like that. But she was stalwart in her demands to be heard, and the result of that was more equality in society. Uh, when we look at the original founding fathers in the American Revolution, what they said was they wanted to be heard in terms of Britain listening to them about what they'd like in their society. So Britain was pushing very hard on the colonists. Uh, they were searching people's homes. They were going through and, and taking their weapons away from them. They were taxing them uh, extravagantly on goods that they were trying to purchase from Britain. Uh, they made them use British ships when they were transporting things around the world. Uh, they also uh, imposed taxes on each piece of paper paper that they were printing, which they rightly saw was a tax on knowledge and newspapers and, and spreading information to other people. And so they rebelled and they said, no more of this. We, we no longer want to live under what we consider to be a tyranny uh, from you, Britain. And they rebelled and they started their own country. And we look at that and we say, that sounds pretty good. That's the origins of America. The origins of freedom was this rebellion. But what I'd like to talk about on the show today is the kind of dark side of this rebellion. So the danger of rebellion is that people who are rebelling will climb up the echelons of power and instate themselves into the power structure. So yeah, they're rebelling, they're getting the people up in arms about how tyrannical the state is and how the government's out of control and things are crazy, but what they really want is to get a hold of the reins of power. So Lenin did this in the Soviet Union. He took over the state by force, and then he imposed this brutal dictatorship on the people of Russia. Now, what kind of got me thinking about this topic are the recent uh, dystopian movies, The Hunger Games and Divergent. And uh, if you haven't seen these movies, don't worry, I'm not going to release any major plot spoilers about them. But there are a couple of key points that I think make a really good uh, conversation piece about the topic at hand, rebellion and the desire for power that the rebels often have. So in Divergent, there is a character called Four, and he's a protagonist in the story. And he realizes that there's a, an unjustified power coming out of the faction system where the government... In, uh, in place is searching throughout the society, trying to find these uh, people that they call divergents. And divergents are people that don't fit into the political system that they've created. And so they um, are searching people's houses, they're going door to door, they're invading people's property with, you know, guns drawn at them and things like that. And uh, he realizes that this is not a uh, system that he wants to be a part of. And so he goes to his mother and he says, Mom, what can we do? Can we, can we fight back against this system? And uh, she says, you know, to join with her in a war against the uh, central government. And uh, he sees in her the glint for power, the desire for power. So it's not just about, you know, getting the people involved and overthrowing this tyranny. It's not just about what the government is doing. It's about throwing out the government, but putting a new government where she is in charge. And The Hunger Games has a very similar scenario. 
the main protagonist, Katniss, finds herself at odds with the central government because it's tyrannical, because it's diabolical. Uh, it uh, forces people to fight in the Hunger Games where uh, innocent people are all gathered from around the country and they all have to fight each other to the death and the last one standing is the winner and, uh, you know, all these terrible things. They force people to work for the capital and to turn over resources to the capital. And so she finds herself obviously at odds with this government. But the rebel forces aren't something necessarily to be desired either. Uh, they want her to do all this propaganda stuff where she has to make videos and in incite people emotionally so that they fight back against the capital. Uh, she has to, she finds herself with all these rules. Uh, they won't let her have a cat and, and all of this stuff. And the danger here, of course, and what is implied in the film, is that the rebels also want power over other people. So it's not just about throwing the ring of power away. It's not about Frodo and uh, Samwise uh, going to Mordor and taking the ring of power and saying, no more, nobody should use power against other people. We're going to throw this ring into the lava, never to be used again. When the rebels get the power, they say that they're going to use it for good, but they tend towards uh, using it for their own self-interest, which is what anyone with power generally does. This is what Lord Acton explained when he said, uh, power corrupts. So at this point, I'd like to tie what we've been talking about back to the American Revolution, because uh, I think people tend to look back on that and they say, yay, revolution, America, you know, fight against British tyranny, uh, founding fathers, create a new country that's wonderful, that's great. But I think that they kind of ignore the dark side of the revolution, which is that some people wanted to get power over other people. And so uh, I think Thomas D. Lorenzo does a great job of explaining this, and he's going to talk about the founding father of constitutional subversion. Upon learning that my new book on Alexander Hamilton, Hamilton's Curse, How Jefferson's Arch Enemy Betrayed the American Revolution, will be published in October, a law student from New York University emailed to say how excited he was to hear of it. He wrote of how sick and tired he was listening to one of his NYU law professors, Nadine Strozen, constantly invoking Hamilton's judicial philosophy to promote bigger and bigger government day in and day out in class. Being schooled in the classical liberal tradition, this student understood that bigger and bigger government always means less and less individual liberty. Hamilton was indeed the founding father of constitutional subversion through what we now call judicial activism. That's why leftist law professors like Strozen lionize him in their classrooms while barely mentioning opposing viewpoints. Hamilton was the leading advocate of a constitutional convention to, quote, amend the nation's first constitution, the Articles of Confederation. He lobbied for seven years to have such a convention convened, constantly complaining to George Washington and anyone else who would listen that we need a government of more energy. Patrick Henry opposed Hamilton by sagely pointing out that the Articles of Confederation had created a government powerful enough to raise and equip an army that defeated the British Empire, and that seemed su sufficient to him. At the convention, which scrapped rather than amended the Articles of Confederation, as had been promised, Hamilton laid out his grand plan. A permanent president who would appoint the governors of each state, and who would, through his state-level puppets, have veto power over all state legislation. A national government with the president given essentially the powers of a king is what he advocated. It was all rejected, of course, when the convention spurned. Hamilton's nationalism and adopted a federal system of government instead, with only a few powers delegated to the central government by the sovereign states, mostly for foreign affairs. Hamilton subsequently denounced the new constitution as a frail and worthless fabric. He and his political compatriots, such as Senator Rufus King of Massachusetts and John Marshall of Virginia, then set about to sabotage the new constitution by reinterpreting the document as something very different from what was clearly written in black and white. His purpose, wrote Cornell University historian Clinton Russiter in his book Alexander Hamilton in the Constitution, was to build the foundations of a new empire. Jefferson and most other founders viewed the Constitution as a set of constraints on the powers of government. 
Hamilton thought of it in exactly the opposite way, as a grant of powers rather than a set of limitations, a potential rubber stamp on anything and everything the federal government ever wanted to do. He and his fellow nationalists, the Federalists, set about to use the loyally manipulation of words to amend the Constitution without utilizing the formal amendment process. Quote, having failed to persuade his colleagues at Philadelphia of the beauties of a truly national plan of government, Rossiter wrote, quote, and having thereafter recognized the futility of persuading the legislatures of three-fourths of the states to surrender even a jot of their privileges, he set out to remold the Constitution into an instrument of national supremacy. And how did he remold the Constitution? He began by inventing a number of myths, i.e. lies, about the American founding. On June 29, 1787, before the Constitution was even ratified, he said that the sovereign states were merely artificial beings that had nothing to do with creating the Union, despite the fact that the Constitution itself declared that the document would be ratified, if it was to be ratified, by the citizens of at least nine of the 13 states. He told the New York State Assembly in that same year that the nation, and not the states, had full power of sovereignty, and clearly contradicting the written constitution and actual history. This lie would be repeated by nationalist politicians from Clay, Webster, and Story to Lincoln. It is still repeated to this day by various apologists for the American empire. When President Washington asked Hamilton his opinion on the constitutionality of a national bank, Hamilton responded with a long-winded report that argued if one reads between the lines of the Constitution, one discovers implied powers that are not specifically delegated to the central government by the states, like the creation of a central bank, for instance. Secretary of State Jefferson was also asked his opinion on the matter and essentially said that all he saw between the lines of the Constitution was blank space. Hamilton prevailed, setting the template for the eventual destruction of the Constitution. Quote, with the aid of the doctrine of implied powers, Rossiter wrote approvingly, Hamilton, quote, converted the powers enumerated in Article 1, Section 8 into firm foundations for whatever prodigious feats of legislation any future Congress might contemplate. He established the foundations for unlimited government, in other words. Hamilton also invented the doctrine of, quote, resulting powers. If the United States ever conquered one of the neighboring countries, he wrote, quote, they would possess sovereign jurisdiction over the conquered territory. This would be rather the result from the whole mass of government than a consequence of powers specially enumerated. Thus, if government engages in an unconstitutional act, such as an undeclared war of conquest, then, according to Hamilton, the fact that the conquest occurred would create a new constitutional right. It was Hamilton who first advocated the broadest possible interpretation of the General Welfare Clause of the Constitution so that he could make his case for corporate welfare in his 1791 report on manufactures. Quote, it is of necessity left to the discretion of the national legislature to pronounce upon these objects which concern the general welfare, he wrote. Naturally, the legislature would be eager to define every piece of special interest legislation to be serving, quote, the general welfare. Again, celebrating the political trickery of his hero, Hamilton, Rossiter wrote that, quote, thus with a flourish did Hamilton convert the fuzzy words about the general welfare from a sort of caption, as Madison described them, into a grant of almost unlimited authority of the federal government. Hamilton was also likely to be the first to twist the meaning of the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, which gave the central government the ability to regulate interstate commerce, supposedly to promote free trade between the states. Hamilton argued that the clause was really a license for the government to regulate all commerce, interstate as well as interstate. For, quote, what regulation of interstate commerce does not extend to the internal commerce of every state, he asked. His political compatriots were all too happy to carry this argument forward in order to give themselves the ability to regulate all commerce in America. Hamilton also invented the notion of special war powers that are not specifically delegated to the federal government by the states. 
He subsequently argued for a standing army, funding of the army, quote, without limitation, and the nationalization of all industries that supplied goods to the army. Jefferson opposed Hamilton on this and all of his other constitutional subversions. In his first annual message to Congress as a president, he said that it is neither, quote, needful or safe that a standing army should be kept in time of peace. In a September 9, 1792 letter to President Washington, Jefferson wrote that he, quote, utterly disapproved of the system of the Secretary of Treasury, who was Hamilton. His system of a national bank, protectionist tariffs, and corporate welfare flowed from principles averse to liberty and was calculated to undermine and demolish the republic. Clinton Rossiter's book on Hamilton and the Constitution is a masterwork of scholarship, but when Rossiter editorializes, he sounds quite giddy in his celebration of Hamilton's subversion of the Constitution. Quote, Hamilton had no equal among the men who chose to interpret the Constitution as a reservoir of national energy, he wrote. All of the nationalist politicians and jurists of early America, from John Jay to Rufus King to Joseph Story and John Marshall, owed Hamilton a debt of thanks for having taught his friends how to read the Constitution. Senator Rufus King of Massachusetts was so impressed by Hamilton's conniving slickness and its potential to cause government to grow vastly larger than what the Constitution called for that he promised him, quote, assistance to whatever measures and maxims he would pursue. Justice Joseph Story became the most Hamiltonian of judges, according to Rossiter, faithfully reproducing the lie that the states were never sovereign. He, quote, construed the powers of Congress liberally, and even found these Alien and Sedition Acts constitutional in retrospect. The Sedition Act outlawed criticism of the federal government, a crystal clear repudiation of the First Amendment for free speech. Story's book, Commentaries on the Constitution, published in 1833, was a roadmap for nationalists who wished to further destroy constitutional limitations on government. It could just as well have been entitled, quote, Commentaries on Alexander Hamilton's Commentaries on the Constitution, says Rossiter. The book was essentially a political training manual for the legal profession's elite, or at least among the part of it educated in the North, during the middle years of the 19th century. The Jeffersonian interpretation of the Constitution, based on actual historical reality as opposed to the lies, myths, and superstitions of Hamilton, Marshall, and Story, was more popular in the South. Perhaps the best exposition of this tradition is St. George Tucker's A View of the Constitution of the United States. The Jeffersonian interpretation of the Constitution was all but wiped out by Lincoln's War, after which Hamiltonian hegemony prevailed for decades. Slowly but surely, virtually all vestiges of Jefferson's strict constructionism were swept away so that by the 1930s, the principle of nationalism and broad construction expounded by Hamilton and his disciples finally monopolized constitutional law in America, wrote Rossiter. Between 1937 and 1995, not a single federal law was ruled unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court. Hamilton's rubber stamp constitution was firmly in place. It is little wonder that a law student like our NYU correspondent, who is familiar with the Jeffersonian and classical liberal traditions, would be disgusted by his pontificating professor's expositions of Hamilton's subversive constitutional trickery. So that article was called The Founding Father of Constitutional Subversion, and it was written by Thomas J. D. Lorenzo, and you can read it online at lewrockwell.com. So the Second American Revolution, which was the Civil War, uh, fought in 1861, is a very similar situation where you had the uh, South who didn't like the tyranny, what they felt was tyranny, coming from the North, which was Lincoln and his taxation and the tariffs that he was trying to impose on the South. Uh, there was a 50% tax that the South were um, feeling from imports of capital goods from England. And so they didn't particularly appreciate that and said, you know, we're just going to start our own country down there. You guys can do whatever you want up there. Just don't tax us anymore. 
Now, the South was not without fault here, however. So there was the slavery issue. Um, but Thomas D. Lorenzo and Judge Napolitano all argue, and I think correctly, that the uh, slavery issue could have been resolved without any sort of war whatsoever. So all the Lincoln and the North, all they had to do was to not return the slaves back to their masters in the South. So the Fugitive Slave Act required that any slaves that were run away, uh, the police would come and grab them and they would come and bring them down to the Southern masters. And uh, all they had to do was stop doing that. As soon as the uh, government gave up its uh, subsidization of slavery by going and grabbing slaves and returning them to their masters, uh, slavery would have just died out uh, very, very quickly. And so that would have been a non-issue. But what the South did do is a uh, military conscription. So they grabbed people and they'd uh, throw them into the military without asking them for their voluntary uh, cooperation in that military. Uh, they were taxing people because, of course, they were a state. So the South is not without any sort of reprimand. However, however the North acted completely belligerently, and that is fairly reprehensible. So when I do focus on the second American Revolution, the Civil War of 1861, I do focus on the North more than the South because their actions were reprehensible, given the plunder and all of the mass murder that they committed against the civilian population in the South. So I'd like to read another article from Thomas Lorenzo talking a little bit about that time period, and it is called The New Generation of Holocaust Deniers. Quote, from the military policies of Sherman and Sheridan, there lies but an easy step to the total war of the Nazis, the greatest affront to Western civilization since its founding. Richard M. Weaver, The Southern Essays of Richard M. Weaver. Having lied about secession, states' rights, the origins of the Constitution, Lincoln, and just about everything having to do with the American Civil War for many generations, the Lincoln cult is now hard at work on its biggest lie of all. That General William Sherman's famous march to the sea did not negatively affect Southern civilians or their property. In its 10,000th attempt, at least, to mentally reconstruct Southerners, the government funded Georgia Historical Society, in cahoots with the Jimmy Carter Presidential Museum, recently paced a marker in Atlanta, quote, near the picnic tables at the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library and Museum, that is supposedly a reassessment of Sherman that has been decades in the making by the Lincoln cult. Sherman was not gratuitously destructive, says the marker. He only targeted military infrastructure. Of course, in reality, Sherman considered every southern person, every acre of southern land, every house, every barn, every blade of grass, every farm animal, and even every family pet as part of the Confederacy's, quote, military infrastructure. Honest historians have documented this in spades for the past 150 years. It is also documented beyond all doubt by the U.S. government's own official records of the war. Nevertheless, the Lincoln cultists now dismiss the extraordinarily well-documented history of Sherman's armies pillaging, plundering, raping, and murdering of Southern civilians as fables and mere family accounts of cruelty. For example, consider just a few of the facts taken from the U.S. War Department publication, War of the Rebellion, compilation of the official records of the Union and Confederate armies. From the official records, a Colonel Ed Underwood of Massachusetts describes Sherman's gratuitous bombing and burning of Atlanta after the Confederate army had left the city as having burned to the ground 37% of the city, according to Sherman's military engineers. This included many private homes and even churches. An Ohio infantryman is quoted as describing an ocean of fire all throughout Atlanta. Eventually, at least two-thirds of Atlanta lay in ashes, according to the official records. A Major Nichols was told that, quote, the Holocaust devoured no fewer than 5,000 buildings. When Sherman's chief military engineer, Captain O. M. Poe, voiced dismay over seeing so many corpses of women and children in the streets of Atlanta, and informed Sherman that the day and night bombardment of the city was of no military significance, Sherman coldly called the corpses a, quote, beautiful sight that would quicken the ending of the war. There were approximately 4,000 private homes in Atlanta before Sherman's bombing, with only around 400 left standing. 
Sherman left a paper trail that was obviously intended to cover his murderous tracks, but at times he issued direct orders to murder civilians. Bothered by his inability to apprehend Confederate snipers who had been shooting at his railroad trains, he sent the following order to General Louis D. Watkins. Quote, Cannot you send over about Fairmont and Addersville? Burn 10 or 12 houses of known secessionists, kill a few at random, and let them know it will be repeated every time a train is fired on? In order to carry out such war crimes, Sherman biographer Lee Kennant writes of how, quote, the New York regiments were filled with big city criminals and foreigners fresh from the jails of the old world. It took a special kind of soldier to carry out Sherman's war crimes. The official records also record how federal soldiers extorted money from southern civilians by demanding insurance payments to avoid having their homes ransacked and burned down. A Major James Austin Connolly is quoted in the following way in response to reports that southerners were hiding their valuables from thieving U.S. Army soldiers. Quote, let them do it if they dare. We'll burn every house, bar barn, church, and everything else we come to. We'll leave their families homeless without food. Their towns will all be destroyed, and nothing but the most complete desolation will be found in our track. The official records also write of how northern reporters associated with the Republican Party newspapers often accompanied Sherman's bummers, as they were called, and then entertained the folks up north with tales of their raping, pillaging, plundering, burning, and murdering. One northern reporter is quoted as saying of Sherman's rampaging looters, quote, If the spoil were ample, the depredators were satisfied, and went off in peace. If not, everything was destroyed, hogs were bayoneted to bleed, chickens, geese, and turkeys knocked over and hung in garlands, cows and calves are shot, the furniture of private homes is smashed to pieces, music is pounded out of pianos with the ends of muskets. Another federal soldier is quoted as saying, quote, I rather feel sorry for some of the women who cried and begged so piteously for the soldiers to leave them a little. But nevertheless, extermination of the civilian population is our only means now. When Sherman reached Hardyville, South Carolina, one of his bombers is quoted in the official records as saying that, quote, In a few hours, a town of half centuries' growth is thus leveled to the ground. This even included a church where, quote, first the pulpit and seats were torn out, many axes were at work. This is undoubtedly an example of what the Lincoln cult means when they refer to military infrastructure. One of Sherman's degradations was known as his War on Dogs. U.S. Army Colonel is quoted in the official records as saying, We were determined that no dogs should escape. We exterminate all. The dogs were easily killed. All we had to do was bayonet them. By the time Sherman was done with South Carolina, one of his officers boasted in the, in the official records that, quote, we have burnt one city, the capital, and most of the villages on our route, as well as most barns, outbuildings, and dwelling houses, and every house that escaped fire has been pillaged. This was no family myth, as the Lincoln cult shamelessly claims, but the words of a senior officer in Sherman's army. Sherman's march to the sea was nothing new. He had been waging total war on the civilian population of the South for years. In 1862, he ordered the complete destruction through fire of the town of Randolph, Tennessee, near Memphis. Around that time, Sherman wrote a letter to his wife saying that, quote, extermination not of soldiers alone, that is the least of the trouble, but the people in general was his intention. That article was called The New Generation of Holocaust Deniers, and it's by Thomas D. Lorenzo. You can read it online at lewrockwell.com. And so we talked a little bit about rebellion and the state and history and all sorts of stuff on the show today. I hope that you enjoyed this. Uh, this has been an episode of the Austrian Circle. I hope that you'll tune in next week for another episode. Have a great week. Take care. <laughs>